Yeah, hello. Welcome back to the Poema Online Learning Weeks. Um, this is the second lecture in a series of three lectures by Michael Putina on Moments. And as last time, you can uh, um, pose questions in the chat, so you should mute your microphone and uh, turn off the camera. But you can uh, post questions uh, anytime in the chat, and Michael can either react immediately or at the end of the lecture. And I don't know if Michael will make maybe make some breaks for for questions. Sure. Um, um, anyway, you can always write in the chat immediately if you want. And uh, now, uh, yes, Michael, you can. Tell us more about moments, please. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Sorry for the late uh, hour here this morning. Uh, I want to review a little just in words what we did last time. And if you have questions, please uh, send the chat. I'll be happy to, to respond. Uh, so we analyze the continued fractions. They apply either to numbers and uh, we saw the construction of real numbers with uh, continued fractions, and then we extended them to a bigger continuum, uh, that of uh, uh, formal uh, series, and uh, we saw the work of Stiltjes, who masterly, based on many examples, uh, he developed in continued fraction a uh, lot of uh, uh, formal series, Laurent series, and uh, he was able to establish convergence based on elementary criteria. By the way, I hope uh, you had fun proving the Koch and Zeidel uh, convergence uh, results. We'll uh, use them today. And then uh, uh, in inside this uh, formal series, uh, a special class is that of uh, generating a series of moments of positive measures. Uh, they have a significance in uh, probability, in mechanics, uh, in uh, pure uh, analysis and uh, and based on that Stiltjes was able to analyze uh, the generating series corresponding to uh, mass distributions on the semi-axis and you remember uh, his uh, main results in the memoir in the Annal de Toulouse and I'll start today with uh, one of his big achievements there one uh, single example, and then um, the theme of today's lecture is uh, uniqueness results, uh, of course, related to moment problems uh, and uh, some uh, maybe not very uh, widespread, very well known uh, criteria of uniqueness. And uh, we'll end up, uh, we start with one variable and we'll end up with uh, several variables. Everything is very classical, I'll give you references. So let's start um, slowly and surely. Uh, the contents um, I um, review from uh, Stiltjes one example, namely a divergent series and how uh, he renormalized this series to make it convergent. And then uh, we'll uh, touch only three major teams due to Carleman, Marcel Ries, and Markov. So let's take the following uh, power series. You know, uh, I hope from school, that you can compute uh, immediately the radius of convergence, uh, nth root of uh, modulus of the nth coefficient, the inverse, and you find that this series diverges everywhere. So there is no way to assume a sum of this series. Uh, to keep the tradition, uh, we work in uh, the variable 1 over z rather than, uh, than w, that's just to put the focus at infinity, uh, minor uh, change. And uh, if, uh, as we did last time, we uh, look at this uh, uh, still very divergent series, we can compute, as uh, you remember, the division algorithm, essentially the Euclidean division. We can compute the 
continued fraction expansion of this uh, as a function of z exactly in the sense of uh, of stiltjes if you remember we have a z and then we have a constant and another z and here there are some coefficients now obviously uh, you remark here there is a big regularity in the distribution of these coefficients and by uh, the Zeidel criterion, which uh, uh, hopefully you reviewed uh, uh, from last time, we immediately find that for any uh, z uh, not uh, uh, real, this is uh, convergent. Why? Because the series 1 over uh, n, 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 and so on is divergent. So we, there is this dichotomy. Very good. So for non-real uh, z, we have a very interesting uh, analytic function, which is uh, nothing else than the representation of this uh, divergent series in a continued fraction. And now we have convergence. So what is going on here? Well, the limit, and this uh, is a master uh, skill, uh, high uh, skill of uh, Stiltjes, is uh, this integral, uh, Laplace transform of a simple rational function. And uh, therefore, uh, what uh, Stiltjes uh, proved, and uh, Poincaré then put in a, a better framework, we have an asymptotic expansion of this uh, integral for z uh, non-real, given precisely by uh, our, uh, our series. So uh, you see, although we have divergence here, if we uh, drop uh, the sum, if we stop at uh, nth level, the difference between uh, the limit and this uh, will be of the order of uh, 1 over z to the next order along the imaginary axis of, or even uh, better in a wedge, which doesn't touch the real uh, axis. So that's the so-called uh, Stiltjes regularization. And he was able to, uh, to make, to give a sense of uh, divergent series exactly in this way. And second, to relate them to, uh, of course, uh, moments and the uh, integrals of this form. Of course, uh, in, in the background is the zeta function. He aimed very hardly and he had some uh, uh, ideas, but uh, uh, failed, of course, to, to prove the Riemann hypothesis. Now, Karleman, we turn the page, we uh, go about uh, 40 years after, and uh, I'll uh, discuss a technical lemma first which uh, gives uh, immediately uniqueness criterion in uh, the uh, moment problem on the line or on the semi-axis. So back with me a little, we have a sequence of uh, lambdas which go, go to infinity, uh, sequence of positive uh, numbers, and we assume that this series is uh, divergent. So everything is positive here. An analytic function in uh, the upper half plane, which satisfies such a majorization for every single n. So you see that uh, we have uh, the powers of 1 over z increasing, but there is a coefficient uh, here related to, to lambda, which satisfies this majorization is identically zero. Now, the, the proof of this is a little technical, uh, is uh, variation of the maximum principle for analytic functions. Uh, it's a little more uh, delicate because it's an unbounded domain, and maybe you know there is the fragment Lindelof uh, theorem, a variation of the maximum principle, which tells you that uh, if uh, you miss one point in the boundary for the maximum principle, but you have some uh, growth conditions exactly like this, then you can still infer a bound for the analytic function. And uh, that, that's a typical uh, 
subharmonic estimate uh, from Lindelof. I'll not go into detail. Uh, you, I'll give you references. So let's put this at work. The moment problem. We know uh, conditions when this is solvable, and let's assume that this has two solutions on the real axis. As we did, uh, and we follow uh, Stiltjes and Markov, uh, it's a good idea to uh, look not at uh, discrete uh, data, but to put them in a continuum. Uh, we take the Cauchy transform or the Laplace transform, in this case, the Cauchy transform, and we know that uh, if uh, these moments exist, then uh, this uh, integral is uh, convergent in the upper half plane. And uh, moreover, uh, along the imaginary axis, it decays like one over Z. This is something we, we discuss. So very good, we have analytic functions too in the upper half plane. Uh, by the way, uh, they uh, have uh, values in the upper half plane. They are so-called uh, peak or Nevanlina or Herglos. There are many names here, functions. And uh, we want to use uh, this uh, following Karleman, this uniqueness criterion. So we take the difference. And um, uh, we remark that uh, just uh, taking uh, uh, the, because the moments are, uh, are equal, we take the difference and the asymptotic expansion will have some uh, cancellations and uh, in the end, the reminder in the uh, Neumann series, if you want, is exactly this one. So the, the polynomial part in the Neumann series is zero because we have the same moments. And then uh, we have simply this uh, uh, simple expression. We estimate and we remark that uh, if we are in a wedge, uh, far away from the real axis, uh, we'll get uh, uh, such an estimate. Um, this is uh, just plain, I'll go back, uh, uh, plain uh, inequalities, uh, nothing uh, mysterious here. The 2n order moment, uh, z to the 2n. And altogether, uh, if we go uh, just above the band, so the imaginary uh, of z bigger than one, we have such a such a bound. Well, uh, the main uh, lemma uh, will tell us immediately uh, that uh, if uh, you remember we had some uh, power of z, which has appears here, and uh, a divergence of uh, the respective coefficients. The constant is S, sorry. C and uh, S are the same, my mistake. Thank you. Um, we, uh, we infer that uh, the divergence of this series, purely in terms of the coefficients, uh, gives the identity between the Cauchy transforms. And then we know the identity of the two measures. So that's uh, an application of uh, the maximum principle for uh, uh, analytic functions uh, devised by uh, Karl Lehmann, which goes uh, way farther than uh, this uh, application to the determinantness of uh, the moment problem. And I'll show you uh, how to play a little with this uh, with fantastic tool, the Karl Lehmann lemma. This, uh, for instance, is satisfied by the Gaussian. You can see it immediately, but and my, many other uh, will return to, to such uh, distributions. Now, if you worked on moments, you were puzzled always that there exists uh, distributions, there exists uh, mass uh, distributions with the same moments, but yet different. I'll show you how to construct many of them. Uh, Stiltjes has in his memoir some uh, derivations uh, using the residue uh, theorem. 
here is something uh, uh, much simpler, and I hope you will carry this message from uh, my lecture, and you will be able to display immediately uh, such uh, examples. So, non-uniqueness. Let's take a function of uh, compact support, C infinity on zero one. In particular, uh, all derivatives are uh, vanishing at the endpoints. And I claim that uh, the square of this derivative, the average of this uh, square, is a Stiltius moment sequence. Why it is so? Uh, you remember uh, we have this determinant criteria, uh, everybody knows them, and we have to check. So we do the positivity of the Hankel matrix, which uh, is nothing else we integrate by parts because we have zero uh, values at the boundary points. We can put derivatives on one side and the other without much pain. And uh, we have uh, here a correlation, an inner product, therefore positive definiteness follows. And if we shift by, uh, by one, uh, we immediately remark that again, we have a gram matrix, uh, which is a positive semi-definite. So both Hankel matrix and this shift are uh, positive semi-definite. Therefore, um, as you know, uh, the generating moments satisfy uh, this for every uh, system of coefficients, the positivity conditions. This is standard. Now, how do we prove non-uniqueness? We take the Fourier transform, the discrete Fourier transform of this uh, function, and it has uh, a uh, real imaginary part. The real part represents the even extension of this to the interval minus one, one. The imaginary part represents the odd extension of this. So essentially what we do here, we uh, flip the function from minus one, one either to an even one, and we get this representation, the Fourier expansion on zero one, or we uh, make it odd and we get this representation. So we have, uh, uh, in uh, short, two Fourier representations on half of uh, the full uh, circle, the full uh, interval of the same function as we extend it to even or odd. Very good. But then, uh, as you remember, uh, we have a Plancherel theorem, which tells us that the, uh, the L2 norm of the Fourier transform is the same as the L2 norm of the coefficients. And uh, we, uh, we get from here, uh, taking derivatives, uh, all these uh, representations. Yeah, so let me go back a little. If uh, I take uh, uh, derivatives uh, of uh, phi, I can move them here, and uh, this will correspond to multiplication by n, the respective power of the Fourier coefficient, the typical property of Fourier series. Uh, therefore, uh, my uh, generating sequence of the, the moments has this representation, but also this one. And what it is special here? Well, uh, these are, uh, if you want, sums of squares. These are discrete measures uh, supported uh, on the semi-axis, and uh, the weights are here. The points are precisely, uh, sorry, the weights are alpha, the points are pi n, and similarly here, but the two representations are obviously uh, different. The coefficients here are uh, quite alpha and uh, uh, beta are uh, quite different. So we have 
the same moment sequence, we just proved that this is a moment sequence, has uh, representations with uh, infinitely but discrete measures, point masses, of different sorts. And the measures are precisely these ones. You see that uh, one measure has uh, uh, point mass, a uh, heavy uh, mass, uh, sorry, at um, zero, and the other one doesn't. So quite different. And this goes uh, for any uh, smooth function uh, with compact support on the interval. We can do the same with uh, the continuous uh, Fourier transform. If we like uh, measures which are not uh, atomic, and uh, the same principle works. So now you got the idea, you take the real imaginary part of uh, the continuous Fourier transform, you have uh, the representation of, uh, of the moments now uh, as uh, Stilte's integral. The weight will be exactly uh, the real, respectively imaginary part of uh, the Fourier transform. And obviously they are, uh, they are quite different. There is much more. And the same method gives a solution to a very famous problem raised by Hadamard and partially solved by Danjois and then fully solved by Carleman, namely the quasi-analyticity. The question is the following. We have a smooth function, including the boundaries, which has a zero initial data for all derivatives at one edge of the defining interval, say at zero. What conditions do the maximum of the derivatives on the respective interval satisfy so that the function will behave like an analytic function. If all derivatives are zero at a point, then the function uh, is propagates and is zero everywhere. If we have a convergent uh, power series. Well, Hadamard uh, was motivated by PDEs. Uh, Danjois uh, found uh, uh, the, the condition, and then Carleman found the necessary and sufficient condition for this to, to happen. What is interesting that our same lemma, our tool, will give a proof, a very sleek, a very uh, elementary and uh, elegant proof of Danjot theorem, and in fact, the solution to the whole problem. So we take uh, this very simple uh, composition of our um, initial function with um, uh, bump, and uh, so that uh, this will vanish not only at zero, but at both points, at zero and one. And we remark that uh, if we take derivatives, we'll have the chain rule and uh, with the soup of the derivatives will appear there, plus a constant, the power n, which is harmless. The moments, as we uh, remarked uh, uh, for the Stilgers problem uh, are, uh, these averages of the derivatives uh, square, they satisfy this bound. Therefore, if you remember the criterion, maybe I'll go uh, back in a second, uh, because uh, the nth truth of uh, this moment is precisely here. We, we have a shift uh, of, uh, of degree. The divergence of this series assures that the moment problem admits a unique solution. But this happens only if uh, phi is uh, identically uh, zero. That means psi is zero. Yeah, we discussed that if the function is non zero, then we have several solutions. Well, the condition 
here will imply that we have a unique solution, and that must be only zero. Brilliant. So the condition in uh, is exactly this one. Kaplan condition. So with the same tool, we uh, we uh, have the best criterion uh, of uh, uniqueness for the moment problem. It works for the line of for the semi-axis, and we have uh, essentially a solution of uh, Hadamard problem. Now uh, Karleman did more, and I'll give you some references here. I only touch; I don't go into the detail. Uh, he followed uh, the school of Hilbert and associated the continued fraction with an uh, infinite uh, quadratic form. The matrix is associated, uh, it's written here, and this is uh, what you recognize, uh, Jacobi uh, matrix. And uh, the recurrence uh, in the continued fraction expansion of the given uh, moment uh, sequence uh, is exactly encoded into these uh, rows of uh, the Jacobi matrix. Well, he made a, a full uh, analysis and he proved that uh, uh, indeed these are the coefficients, the approximants uh, of, uh, of the continued fraction, that this uh, will be given by uh, Cauchy transform and believe it or not, that's the beginning of uh, the spectral analysis, as uh, Hellinger, Hilbert, uh, Hahn, and many others said. Uh, Schiltjes was very uh, uh, close to this, but didn't analyze uh, quadratic forms. I'll not go into this detail, but you have to be aware that here we touch uh, spectral analysis at its uh, heart. And the approximants will be, uh, uh, of course, uh, rational functions, which uh, are uh, the best, uh, uh, the best uh, approximants uh, in many senses of this uh, this function. And we have the asymptotic expansion, and and so on. You remember probably Edward the lectures uh, in this. Um, uh, setting, uh, there is a second uniqueness um, result uh, related to the Christoffel function. And uh, this is if and only if. We have this approximates the, uh, what uh, it turned out to be the orthogonal polynomials and uh, the divergence of this series will give you uh, uniqueness of uh, the solution of the moment problem. I'll return to this in a minute. I just wanted to, uh, to tell you that uh, there is more uh, in the direction of spectral analysis. Now, the books of uh, Karleman are very precious, and I uh, strongly recommend you, if you go into this uh, area, to browse, to even to read them, because there are ideas, as you saw, uh, which uh, are not widely uh, known and circulated. Now, again, just touching another field, if you like mechanics and uh, you find that it, everything we did is too algebraic or too analytic, there is a very beautiful reconsideration and derivation completely on mechanical grounds of Stilte's analysis of the continued fraction related to the oscillation of, uh, of strings. Of course, uh, the spectral analysis, what I mentioned before, is related to the oscillation of strings, but this was uh, uh, done uh, much uh, later. This is a reprint of several papers by Gandmacher and Crane. And the original uh, work is a short one. I uh, know only a Russian uh, edition of it uh, by Crane, has a complete derivation of uh, Stilte's memoir, starting only with um, vibration of strings. 
So he interprets uh, the coefficients in the continued fraction as uh, mechanical uh, concepts and uh, has uh, very interesting, uh, far-reaching uh, work. I'll not touch this, but if you like mechanics, have a look. I go back where uh, uh, Marcel Ries uh, uh, did uh, some uh, analysis again of the uniqueness problem from a totally different point of view. So he wrote several notes on moments. They are all very interesting. And from the third one, I extract just a very basic uh, and uh, fun, I hope, uh, criteria. So let's suppose uh, we have a moment sequence on the line. As you know, we uh, associate to this uh, uh, linear functional on the space of polynomials, which takes uh, the monomial to CN. And the known positivity condition. This is uh, non-zero on squares of uh, polynomials. If you want Hermitian squares here. And uh, if we take any uh, continuous function of polynomial growth, we would like to extend this functional to the respective uh, continuous function. So polynomial growth at infinity minus infinity. And we want this to be uh, the extension to be, of course, the same for polynomials and to preserve the order among continuous functions. Well, this was done by Marcel Ries uh, uh, step by step by induction, exactly as we prove Han Banach. And by the way, this was uh, before Han and Banach had their uh, extension of linear functionals. And uh, this can be done in the following uh, uh, simple way. We have a, a lower functional. That means uh, given a continuous function, we take all polynomials which are under it and we take the soup. This should be by our assumption less than the value of the functional on that continuous phi, and this is less than the upper functional, which is the inf over all values of polynomials which uh, majorize this function. Very natural idea, we use the order here. And now the striking observation of uh, Ries. If phi is not a polynomial and just one single function and the lower and upper values of this functional are different, then the moment problem is indeterminate. Obviously, if uh, the moment problem is determinate, uh, these functions will be integrable with respect to the respect to the measure and uh, the two extreme lambda star lambda upper star would coincide. So it suffices one single non-polynomial function to test whether the problem is indeterminate or determined. Quite surprising. Now, what is behind this? Because uh, the interesting part is uh, how he proved this. Well, you remember the Christoffel function. And uh, this appeared much earlier. Uh, of course, Christoffel, Darbu, Hamburger was uh, very uh, uh, supportive and uh, put in the correct light uh, this uh, quantity, uh, very important number for uh, uh, Z. Uh, we compute uh, exactly uh, this inverse of uh, the sum of uh, squares of orthogonal polynomials and uh, uh, using uh, what uh, I just mentioned, the linear functional, we immediately remark that this is the infimum uh, 
sorry, I didn't. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, I only now I read the the three term recurrence relation are exactly the coefficients in uh, in the Jacobi matrix. Yes, of course. Sure. Sorry, I'll take a break after this and we'll discuss uh, some details. So uh, what uh, Marcel Ries was able to, to do is to prove that uh, this Christopher function, rather the inverse, satisfies a minimal exponential type growth in the whole complex plane. So assuming that uh, the moment problem is indeterminate, this will have finite values everywhere. And what uh, Marcel Ries proved, and that's highly non-trivial, is that we have this uh, exponential type, but we call it minimal type because uh, for uh, this epsilon tends to zero at infinity. So uh, for every small uh, quantity here, uh, this reciprocal is uh, bounded by uh, e to the uh, epsilon z. So using this, assume in the terminus, And assume that for this uh, function, we have the lower and upper uh, uh, functionals um, equal. Then, of course, there are uh, sequences of uh, polynomials uh, from below, from above, and uh, they will converge in uh, functional to, to zero. And for a fixed uh, value, uh, we use uh, the variational representation. You remember maybe from Edward of, uh, of the Christopher function, and we have this estimate. So this is the best estimate for such an inequality. Therefore, because we have here the exponential uh, type, both Q and P will converge to an entire function, and it will be the same entire function. This entire function uh, has uh, uh, control growth, so it's a polynomial plus minimal exponential type. But the function, the original function uh, we, uh, we had has polynomial growth. And then again, uh, the maximum principal fragment Lindelof implies that uh, F is a polynomial. So it's a brilliant uh, proof. And uh, I'll show you one example, and then I'll take a break and we go back to uh, the details. So what continuous functions do we know for which uh, we have ready made uh, lower and upper polynomials? Cosine, obviously. And uh, we take this, uh, this function, the expansion of uh, cosine. Uh, here should be an uh, equal, my mistake. So cosine of ax is a function equals to the series. And uh, we know how uh, if we stop uh, with a plus, we have an upper polynomial. If we stop with a minus, uh, a lower. And uh, therefore, the, the gap between the two values of the functional are uh, exactly uh, majorized by such a quantity. A is a parameter. Let's assume that we are in the indeterminate case that for this very function, we have a positive lower bound. Then we uh, work a little uh, the inequality, we take the nth root, and we remark that uh, the infimum limit of uh, this uh, nth root of uh, s, the coefficient, is bigger than 1 over but A was arbitrary. So if limit of this uh, quantity is finite, the problem is determinate. 
This is slightly weaker than uh, Carleman criterion, which said that uh, the inverse of this uh, series is divergent. But uh, it's valuable because the, the proof is quite different. So uh, let's take a little break and uh, I'll go back to the quadratic form, the Jacobi matrix, and indeed these are exactly the coefficients in the 310 relation of the orthogonal polynomial. That's very classical. Jacobi matrix, lambda is the spectral parameter, and we have the three-term uh, continuity. Uh, it is uh, interesting how this has uh, entered into the spectral analysis. Uh, prior, these were, as you see, elements in the continued fraction. So this was way before the infinite matrix uh, the papa and uh, uh, the recurrence relations uh, among the convergence of uh, of the continued fraction are uh, reflected exactly uh, in the three ten relations of the orthogonal polynomials and they appear in the continued fraction you see precisely here what we have uh, lambda is a uh, parameter is a complex parameter, the spectral parameter, and this takes care of uh, the representation in terms of what we call the spectral measure, rho, the solution of the moment problem is the spectral measure, and so on. Are there other questions concerning these two, let's say, chapters, because I'll move on to a different one. If not, let's continue then. I turn the page. Still speaking about uniqueness, but in a much stronger sense for the truncated moment problem. As you know, there are a lot of works. Uh, you deal with finite point masses, cubature formulas. I'll uh, touch only one aspect, which uh, is related to the Markov moment problem. And uh, it will appeal to, uh, I think, to most of you who had some interaction with, uh, with moment problems. Let's take a simple example, the positive quadrant versus quadrant one and three, the positive and its opposite. One is given by two polynomial inequalities. The other is given by one. Proof, for instance, that uh, the quadrant cannot be given by a single inequality. And uh, we'll use the moment problem to give a characterization of such uh, semi-algebraic sets. I call them principal semi-algebraic sets, basic semi-algebraic sets, which can be given by a single inequality. We fix a background. This will be the box, if you want, will be the frame, a positive Borel measure, which decays fast at infinity. And the support is not uh, contained on uh, an algebra or a real algebraic set. So if a polynomial has average zero, the modulus of the polynomial, this must be zero. Typical example, uh, we'll take a compact support, a square or a disk. Fix an uh, order and a constant L. And we deal like in uh, image processing, uh, we have a shade function I call it G. And uh, shade means that is measurable and uh, is bounded between minus L and L. This, for instance, is white, uh, L is black, and in between we have all colors, all of degrees of gray, if you want. 
And we like to reconstruct this uh, or approximate from finitely many moments. We work in uh, any number of uh, variables, so uh, these are the, the moments. As we know, uh, we follow karate Odori, we take all potential moments, they fill a uh, uh, convex set. Uh, we put it, uh, so this is the moment space in an Euclidean, uh, uh, Euclidean space. And it's uh, convex, and if we take a linear functional uh, uh, there, this automatically is given by a polynomial. Probably you saw this many times. Indeed, uh, if we apply a linear functional to this uh, uh, element uh, of, uh, consisting of moments, is a sum, uh, linear sum, homogeneous, so it's nothing else than the integral of a polynomial against uh, G and the background measure. So we have the basic L1, L infinity um, inequality. And uh, this is taken, of course, on the support of, uh, of the measure. Now, if the point uh, you have, I didn't make a picture, but you can imagine immediately, if we have this convex set and the point is in the interior, or the inequality uh, here is strict, we can wiggle a little uh, uh, the data and have the same values. So we are on the level set of, uh, of this functional and we have several uh, solutions. Therefore, uh, the shade function is not determined by its measurements by the finite moments in such a situation. On the contrary, if uh, this inequality is uh, strict, let's say uh, L is one here, I forgot to put L, then necessarily uh, when we have equality in such a situation, when uh, G uh, compensates uh, exactly uh, with the sign of uh, age, for some age. So G has necessarily to be the signal plus or minus one times L. So it's a very simple function given by a simple uh, equation, single polynomial, which uh, changes colors from black to white. So conclusion, only black and white pictures with the interface between the two shades given by a single algebraic equation are determined by finitely many power moments. You can prove this back and forth and the minor normalization we can take the shade function between zero and one and uh, we get uh, immediately that uh, the only solutions, the only extremal solutions of this uh, moment problem, Markov moment problem, with unique, uniquely determined by the moment data are uh, characteristic functions of uh, sub-level sets of uh, algebraic uh, equations in the support, of course, in the frame. So the Orton again, uh, quite uh, remarkable uh, if uh, we take just the positive uh, Orton in any number of variables, but let's say in two, there exists a measurable function which has the same moments as the full Orton, yet this is different. Why? Because it's not given by a single equation. On the contrary, if we work with uh, the octant and its opposite, uh, then uh, such an equality only up to degree two will uh, imply that the shade function is precisely a uh, characteristic function. So the, uh, I think this is hard to prove directly without this duality argument. Now, 
the moment problem, what Markov did and why I bring this, uh, uh, this discussion. Let's go in one variable. The frame is uh, minus one, one. Le big measure, the shade function is uh, just uh, absolutely continuous uh, against Le Bel. We have the moments. And of course, we discussed many times the generating function is the Cauchy transform of, uh, of uh, the measure. What Markov did is quite uh, remarkable and uh, illuminating for a lot of uh, applications. We take the generating function of the moments, we take its formal exponential, in this case will be even convergent in our example, and we form another series. Originally, he expanded this into continuous fraction, but we know much more now, and uh, and uh, we can deal uh, with uh, different tools. And what he remarked is that uh, this exponential transform will take the moments of a shade function to the moments of a positive measure with compact support and vice versa, if and only if. The proof is rather simple function theory. I'll not go into this detail, but uh, it's a, an important dictionary because here we have uh, shade functions, excuse me. Here we have all possible moments. So there exists such a bijective correspondence between measures and absolutely continuous measures. We discussed the extremal ones, and no wonder what would be extremal here will be finitely many point masses. And uh, the condition, as Markov remarked, that this measure is determined by finitely many moments, if and only if the transform of it is degenerate. That means, in the sense of moments, the Hankel matrix has zero determinant at a certain level. And then we know that G necessarily is a sublevel set of a polynomial function. Then uh, this uh, very fortunate situation corresponds, as you know, to a rational expression. So this exponential is rational. And to determine these polynomials, it's a matter of uh, taste, uh, of uh, skill, uh, is the Padé approximation or uh, just a plain algebraic computation. I'll show you a very simple uh, example, and then we continue next uh, next time. So let's take uh, just the Cauchy transform of uh, uniform mass between A and B. Z is in the upper half plane. This is integrable, is the log. The exponential annihilates the log, so it's a rational function. This rational function can be uh, rearranged uh, a little and is precisely one plus a positive mass against the Cauchy kernel. What we discussed before is the general form of this. And now you can imagine that if you take finitely point masses here, you'll have a union of, uh, of intervals and the shade function will be just uh, one, zero, one, zero, and so on. There is more to say here, uh, just basic references. We'll continue next time. Um, for uh, this transform, uh, there is a rather recent uh, work uh, of Farongine and Donoghue, uh, if you like function theory, and the whole Markov moment problem is in a book by Crane and Nodal. So I'll stop here. I uh, promise you uh, another problem, and I would like you to consider, and maybe we discuss uh, now or uh, next time, the following striking observation of Poya that if you give an arbitrary sequence of numbers, 
there exists a side measure decaying fast enough at infinity so that these numbers are exactly its moments. And you can choose this either to be purely atomic or absolutely continuous. So there are many choices of such measures. So if we drop the positivity condition for the measure, which is physical, probabilistic, uh, has uh, many uh, uh, motivations, then you can reach any sequence of numbers here. And you have the proofs. Uh, I'd like to uh, invite you to read a little and maybe try to, to do these uh, proofs. You see there are only a couple of pages, very simple. And uh, maybe we discuss uh, next time. If there are uh, questions. So are there any questions? Uh, if nobody has a question right now, I would like to pose a question. Please. So you were speaking about this key property uh, discovered by Markov, uh, the formal exponential transform. Yes. Uh, could we go back to this slide? Yes. So uh, I'm really not an expert, so maybe I'm totally wrong, but what would happen if you take here uh, the formal logarithm of this uh, series, maybe it doesn't even make sense. Oh, it, it, ma it makes uh, it's it's, it, it, Instead of the exponential, wouldn't you then get the generating function of a cumulants or something like this? <laughs> yes, yes, it's related to cumulants. Yeah, yeah, sure. So you take, uh, it's very much related to cumulants. Uh, and uh, Markov was uh, all his career interested in probability and he proved the central limit theorem with these tools. So uh, I don't know exactly if cumulants appeared in his computations, but uh, obviously there is a log here. Uh, then this series is just a log of uh, the a little transform generating series of the moments and resembles very much the cumulants. Yes, of course. So, so it, it, it seems that the SK would be something like a cumulants if the T would be the moments or something. Very, very much so. Oh, uh, okay. Yes, Bernard, uh, I interrupt you a little. Uh, this extends to the multivariate case, and that's the topics of my next lecture. So we start from here, the multivariate case, and. Uh, We'll do it in the next lecture. Okay. Are there other questions? If not, we would like to thank the speaker. Uh, it's not so easy in this online format, but uh, you might clap your hands and even turn on your microphone. <laughs> and um, um, we are looking forward to the to the next lecture, which is next week, exactly the same day, the same time. And it will be the last lecture in this uh, series of lectures. <laughs>